I'm going to say something that maybe I'll hope will be provocative, right? And that is that if you grew up in a small town, you may have a wider acquaintance with human types than if you live in a large city where you can self-select. That's right. right. <laughs> That's right. You can, you can, you know, in a place like Toronto, you can sort of decide yeah. who you're going to hang yes, out with. Yes, you can. Good evening, everyone. My name is Yvonne Hunter, and I'm the head of programming here at the Appel Salon at the Toronto Public Library. Tonight, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome from my home province of Saskatchewan, award-winning Canadian novelist and short story writer Guy Vanderhaeg in conversation with the CBC's Michael Enright. Michael Enright has been the host of CBC Radio's Sunday edition since September 2000. Prior to joining the Sunday edition, he hosted This Morning for three years and for 10 years hosted As It Happens. He has held many important editorial positions with Canadian magazines and newspapers. Please welcome Michael Enright. Thank you and welcome. Good to have you here. I'd like to read something uh, from a book. It's by, uh, wait a minute, uh, Guy Van Der Haag. <laughs> it's called Daddy Lennon. I just want to read a paragraph, if I can. A teenager with frank blue eyes, a scallop of toffee-colored hair artfully arranged on his forehead, and a pair of downy sideburns bracketing a ruddy, docile face he passed down the corridors, waxed and buffed to a, so high a gloss that they swam in the flickering, watery light. Now, I know writers uh, who would run over their grandmothers to get a sentence like that uh, in, a, in a book. It's from the opening paragraph of a story called 1957 Chevy Bel Air, which is one of the stories <clears throat> pardon me, in Guy Van de Haag's latest book called Daddy Lennon. The latest collection of stories bears the same dynamic authenticity of character and place that we've seen in all his work, whether short stories or novels. The protagonists are instantly recognizable and their pains and pleasures are drawn with a deft and profoundly human touch. Guy van der Haag was born in Estehazy, Saskatchewan. He attended the University of Saskatchewan, where he received a master's degree in history. He is the winner of two Governor General's Awards, first in 1982 with his short story collection, Man Descending, and again in 1996 for his novel, The Englishman's Boy. His work has been adapted for television and film, which has underscored his international reputation. Ladies and gentlemen, the author of Daddy Lennon, Mr. Guy van der Haag. Grab a seat. When somebody reads from your work as badly as I just did, what, do you, what goes through your head? What do you think? I, no. What I think is how much better a job you did than I would have. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I go through periods of being phobic about doing public readings. Um, and I hope now that I've sort of got over my last episode of phobia. So I'm actually pretty happy when somebody else will read my work. It's, it's kind of flattering. Are you actually. any good at it? I mean, reading your own work? Um, You're getting better, are you? Or? Well, it's not that I'm getting better. I mean, when I was really young and innocent, I, I kind of didn't know any better. The first public reading I ever did was at Harborfront, and right. uh, I was paired with an international star, and my attitude was kind of like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but now I do. Yeah, <laughs> you know? good. I'm somehow glad and relieved to hear that tonight. <laughs> Every, not every critic, but many critics have called you Canada's greatest chronicler of the West. 
is that irksome to you? Is that a, a pigeonhole? It's, it's not irksome, but it neglects many other important chroniclers of the West. Uh, Rudy Weeb, W.O. Mitchell, Sinclair Ross, Margaret Lawrence, Robert Croach. I mean, the list can go on and on. But you're our Wallace Stegner. I mean, <laughs> I would be very flattered to be Wallace Stegner, but I don't quite believe it. I mean, I, I think the thing is that literature is a big, big tent, right? And nobody occupies that tent by themselves, even a regional tent. Like, you know, when people talk about maritime writing yeah. or Western writing, of any kind. There are many, many different kinds of writers and many, many different kinds of writing. But in your work, though, it, it, the idea of landscape is almost another character in the novel or the story or whatever. Landscape is important to you. Yes, but <clears throat> it's, kind of, I'm unre it's unreflexively important to me. I mean, in the sense, I'm the definition of a provincial. I've lived my entire life in one province. And so the landscape for me is second nature. I mean, I don't consciously try to render the landscape. I suppose I would be like a writer from Toronto who decided that they were going to write about Young and Bloor, right? And I don't think they would sit down and say, how am I going to render? <laughs> they, they would do it. Um, in the, I, I guess the one sense when I'm thinking about, about landscape, the one thing that I'm conscious, or try to be conscious of, is not to reflexively do what other Western Canadian or even American writers right. have done about, about landscape. I try to make it new, um, but you can only make things so new. You can't make them completely new. But there's something about Western, I, I, don't, I hate the, I don't want to use the phrase, although I'm going to plunge ahead and use it, Western regional writing. There's an element of haunting and of striving and of even death. And there, there seems to be more dramatic elements about Western writing than certainly Young and Bloor and, and Maritimes or whatever. Well, <clears throat> I, I think because we are closer to beginnings. The Maritimes, Ontario, Quebec, other parts of the country have been settled much longer than, than our part of the world. Memories of certain elemental, epical events, like, for instance, what in Saskatchewan is always referred to as the Dirty Thirties, which meant yes. we had an economic depression, and we had a drought. So pe my, my father lived through that, and, and his brothers and sisters. And so somehow, I think that tends to get, I wouldn't say it's genetic, but it, it's present in your mind. And, and so nature and elemental forces, perhaps you're a little bit more aware of them. Is it true that when you were growing up in Estehazy, there was a livery stable in the town? Yes, absolutely. And um, people rode into town? And... Uh, some farmers came in in buggies, and particularly in the winter, they came in what were called cabooses, which were almost like a railway caboose that had a stove in them, because it would be like minus 40 degrees, mm -hmm. and, and so people would have a coal stove or a wood stove in the back of a caboose. So then when you got into the town, you had to have a place to stable your horses. Um, now, I wouldn't say that this was absolutely widespread, but people were still doing. And I, I think sometimes when I indulge myself in telling anecdotes and stories, people kind of think, oh, you were born in the 19th century. <laughs> uh, which is not quite true. I mean, you know. Yeah, no. Was there a, a Carnegie Library or any kind of library in the town? Not until I was about 11 years old. And the library was actually one room in what was called the town office, and it was largely stocked with books that people didn't want. Um, and so there was no librarian. 
which meant that I could go in there and read anything I wanted. It was absolutely unsupervised reading. So, I mean, I read a, lo you know, a lot of things I found very interesting, like relatively racy Frank Yerby novels about <laughs> pirates, like when I was like nine years old. But I, you know, I just read whatever I wanted. You read a thing called, and I don't mean to be uh, denigrating, but Whoop Up Country. Mm -hmm. What the hell was Whoop Up Country? When I was about nine years old, um, I stumbled on a history of, that was actually written by an American historian about what he called Whoop Up Country. And Whoop Up Country was northern Montana, principally with its sort of focus was Fort Benton, and then running as far east as present day Regina and as far west as Calgary. And, and that was almost, I don't know how to describe it, almost like a duchy in and of itself because American influence, aside from Americans being, being in that area, there was, there was kind of no government at all. And this right. was before the Northwest Mounted Police came west. When I read this, I, I, and I, I think I might have been maybe eight or nine years old. It was a historian called Paul Sharp. When I read the story of the Cypress Hills Massacre, oh, yeah. I never forgot it. Yeah. I never forgot it. And, and it was probably in the early 1990s that I kind of returned to that memory and said to myself, I want to write fiction that has something to do with that. When you, and I'm assuming you played cowboys and Indians, were you a cowboy or an Indian? <laughs> I was, actually, there, there's, there's a photograph of me when I'm about four years old, standing beside my, my grandmother with my wooden, I'm, I, you know, now this is terribly politically incorrect, I of realize course. that, but I was like five years old. I'm standing there with a wooden tomahawk, a breech clout, uh, and all sorts of lipstick smeared all over my face, <laughs> And black braids that my that my my grandmother had made me out of black cloth, you know, that were braided. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. the long answer to the question was, I was an Indian. <laughs> you, you, you stayed there. You said that you you your influences growing up were in that town and with those people, but you've lived. You moved to Ottawa at one point. You mm -hmm. stayed for a year and a half or something. And then you said people, writers have to vote with their feet. You had to get back. Why did you have to get back? When I say writers have to vote f um, with their feet, I should have said I had to vote with my feet. I don't, I don't believe that a writer has any, is responsible for, for staying where they began. There was a kind of moment that, that's linked to <coughs> Canadian cultural nationalism. So, you know, what was going on in, in Toronto in the 60s and 70s, there was a regional reaction to that in which people in the regions were saying, well, Canadian culture also includes this. It, it includes places like, like Saskatchewan. And that was the foundation of the Saskatchewan Writers Guild, a literary magazine called Grain. And I think there was a feeling that we ought to take a stand of some kind. Was it, it, was it the view of, from regions, the view of Toronto that a lot of Americans have about New York? In other words, it was elitist, it was uh, indeed incestuous, it was, it, was, it was ignorant of the rest of the country. Perhaps a touch of that, but I think the most important thing is, is that Toronto as the kind of middleman of culture where, where, where the large publishers were and all the rest of it, there was, there was a feeling that the regions were being neglected. And so there was something called, what was that, in, in the Coppell Valley, a place called Fort Coppell, there was a writing, um, writing workshops that were established there in which actually people like Gordon Lish from New York were attracted oh, yeah. to come. 
um, you know, Robert Croach, Jack Hodgson's, Rudy Weeb, uh, you know, a whole series of writers who, who people went to learn from. And, but what they did when they went to learn was not just how to write, but my claim is to learn how to write their plays and to say that this place is worthy of attention. But you didn't feel a compulsion that you had to come to Toronto and make it in Toronto. Um, no, but <clears throat> I, was, I was always rather reclusive. Like when I, when I, when I talk about all the writers that went to Fort Sam and in the Coppell Valley, I never went, <laughs> you know. I'm talking about, about you know, very distinguished um, Lorna Crozier, the distinguished oh, poet. Oh, wonderful. You know? yeah. So, but I was kind of, you know, when I talk about voting with my feet, I was kind of leery about declaring myself. I didn't want to say that I was a writer until I had published a book, <laughs> and, you know. I didn't, I, so that kept me in some ways separate from, from, from some of that, but it was kind, it was my conviction that something important could happen there. Was, it, <clears throat> was there an antipathy or a frustration or even an anger with the young and bluer literati. I'm, you know, in many ways, I, I think that people in that part of the world felt allied to them, in the sense that we were all about the same thing, which was writing our country. Right. Okay. Right. But the feeling was <laughs> is that one part of the country's voice was not necessarily being heard, and so it was our responsible responsibility to make it heard. I'm not talking about a manifesto, you know. Like, the we West wants <laughs> in. Yeah. Not, not no, that. we didn't, you know, it, it, it was more of a feeling. It was, it was the sense that, okay, um, we're not going to be heard unless we make ourselves heard. The, the, uh, the tenor of the stories in, in Daddy Lennon, um, uh, there's a lot of not emphasis, but there's a lot of going back. There's a lot of high school. There's a lot of Chevy Bel Airs. There's a lot of growing up. Um, and sometimes that can get kind of tedious. It doesn't with your work. And I got the sense that you were uh, some kind of high school student. I mean, did you, were you successful or were you a nerd or were you, did you belong to the Spanish club or? <laughs> I, I was a, I was a really, really unsuccessful high school student. Why is uh, that? I, I got bored and I fell into bad, bad company. Um, there's some bad company in the in the story. <laughs> there's a few, um, but I remember <coughs> at that time in Saskatchewan, everybody coming out of high school wrote what was called departmental exams that were right. marked in the capital, and at that time to go to university, you had to have a 65 average. I, <clears throat> I was absolutely certain I would not, <coughs> excuse me, acquire a 65 average. So I was working on an irrigation project in Osuyas, BC. Um, luckily for me, a lot of the exams that they set were actually quite difficult that year. So the bell cur curve had to be adjusted, <laughs> which meant that, that Really good students got their marks suppressed, and bad students like me got bumped. Of course. And I, I cleared that. I vaulted over that hurdle. I think I had something. I think I had something like sixty-five point three. And when the good news arrived at my home, my mother immediately signed me up to go to university, and then phoned me and said, "You know, you're going to university." But you have a master's degree in history, though. I mean, mm -hmm. that's. What drew you to, to history rather than, I don't know, English or? Well, I mean, I was always intensely interested in English literature, and, and now here's the nerd part comes up. Okay. The, the, the nerd part comes later. As I was studying history, I used to go and look at the reading lists for English classes. Then I would go to the library, and I would read, those, the books? And I would read those books. 
but I always say that my, my literary opinions were arrived at unsupervised, right? <laughs> like, there, was, there was no prof telling me what <coughs> I was to think about these particular books. I was just reading them. Um, history, I mean, I still think that, that history is immensely important. Um, and I, I do have, you know, it, it, it might be an old man's prejudices, but I, I kind of regret that, that in, many, in many jurisdictions, history is not taught as a discipline in the schools anymore. But it's a construct, isn't it, history? Yeah, I, and... It's and, like, it, not quite like what a novelist does, but you don't, I think you eschewed the idea or the, the title of fictional or historical fiction. Um, you want the emphasis on... On fiction. On fiction, not on the adjective. Well, I always think about, about Donald Creighton, who said that history is the conjunction of character and circumstance, which is essentially a story. Right. And I, I kind of think of fiction that way. It's character and circumstance. So you put a certain character in certain circumstances, the outcome will be different. All right, let's talk about story then, because I remember you told me once years ago that you had written a long, I don't know if it was a novel or a short story, or whatever, and you pulped it, you threw it out because it was the wrong voice. What does that mean, the wrong voice? Um, I would say that anything that you're working on has to speak to you to speak to anyone else. If I distrust what I'm writing, if I, if I don't feel committed to it, if I don't think of it as being, and I put quotation marks around this word, true. Okay. Um, if, I don't, if I don't feel that it's true, I don't trust it, and I don't expect anyone else to trust it. But all that work, you would just spike it. Just... Yeah, I, you know, I argue you have to do that. Like with my students, um, they will say to me, "Is it?" Po they say this hopefully. They say, "Is it possible to revise too much?" <laughs> meaning, meaning, can, can I get by with one draft? And I always say, "Yeah, it is possible to revise too much." The great Russian short story writer Isaac Babel said, I wrote this story 97 times. I should have stopped at 96. <laughs> um, so it, it seems to me that, that fiction, like any endeavor, takes more hard work than, than it's ever given credit for. OK, but is it harder to find the voice in a short story than in a novel, which is more, uh, I'm assuming, is more expansive with a greater degree of, of flexibility. I would actually argue the opposite. Okay. I, th I think in the short story, often the intimate voice, what I would call, you know, the first person or the third person subjective, uh, is more frequently employed right, because a short story almost always circles around a very few characters, maybe one or two. Right. So the, the viewpoint is more limited. A novel, I think, needs to paint a bigger canvas. And I keep, my explanation, I keep on falling back on Nadine Gordimer, who said of the short story, it's like the flash of fireflies in the night. Um, a short story, I think a very good short story, briefly illuminates a character's life. And it works a bit like poetry. If you think of the, the narrative in a short story as a puzzle, the puzzle snaps into place with the end of the story. I think of a novel as being more incremental. So you live with these characters for a longer period of time, and you slowly learn more and more yeah. about the character. Um, and I'm playing off Nadine Gordimer. I sometimes say that if a short story is the flash of fireflies in the night, a novel is a high beam, steady glare. You know, because uh, um, not that a novel is more intensive or intense than a short story but more light needs to be shed 
on the development of the narrative from beginning to end. What did you get from, as you said, your influences of Flannery O'Connor and Alice Munro? Again, they could be called regional writers, couldn't right. they? Clinton in one case and the South in the other. Um, I, I think that... What, what, I think what... They gave me a certain amount, not of confidence, but a belief that, that, that it was possible to do good writing and good work and not necessarily be located in a huge metropolitan center. And I, I think that that's even true when you think like the history of English literature, yeah. you know, the Bront Brontes in Yorkshire, Jane Austen, you know, outside of London, to a certain extent, people like, like Hardy. Uh, Faulkner in Oxford, Mississippi. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a whole series of, of 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 writers who I don't think it could be disputed that they aren't writers of excellence, but had chosen to some one way or the other to sink their roots deeply uh, in the place that that they inhabited. The characters in in your stories in in Daddy Lennon, they um, I think everyone will recognize them. Uh, families that our parents told us not to go near. <laughs> uh, crazed high school brother bullies, strange people. Um, are they, now I'm not going to ask you if it's autobiographical, but are, are they from some distant Van de Haag past? Or? Okay, I'm going to say something that maybe I'll hope will be provocative, right? And that is that if you grew up in a small town, you may have a wider acquaintance with human types than if you live in a large city where you can self-select. That's right. right. <laughs> That's right. You can, you can, you know, in a place like Toronto, you can sort of decide yeah. who you're going to hang yes, out you with. Yes, can. But if you live in a small town, um, you know everyone. You, and they know you. And they know you. They yeah. know your history. And... And, and they know your family. Exactly. And, and I, I'm, I'm being confessional here, but my name is Vanderhig, but my mother's family were, were called Allens, right? And, and if I happened to say that my mother was an Allen, you could just seize it. <laughs> just, <laughs> the skull would descend like, oh, oh you know. <laughs> you have bad blood. One of them. <laughs> one, yeah, of them. one of them. What was high school like for you? Did you ever own a, or drive a 57 no, Chevy I, Bel Air? I should have been so lucky. Magnificent car. Yeah, no, I know. That's a, it was kind of like my ideal. That's yeah. why the story's called 1957 Chevy Bel Air. Uh, I mean, basically, uh, I think I walked through it as a zombie. <clears throat> and, so, I mean, one of the things that happened to me was, <clears throat> unfortunately, in those days, people got skipped. Classes. Skip classes. So <coughs> I arrived in high school and I was very, very young. And it's almost in self defense, I, I began to um, try to ingratiate myself with the people that it was necessary for me to in, ingratiate myself with. And so I, I kind of became a midget mascot, you know, mm -hmm. because I was. <coughs> I was you know, pretty tiny. Um, <coughs> and then I ended up, <laughs> in those days, students were, were stacked according to it, how they did on exams. And my, <coughs> my high school had five classes of grade 10s, and I was in 10E. And, and like, <coughs> you could go no lower than 10E. And, and, and we did really educational things like putting, you know, beans in between wet blotting paper right. and then sit waiting for them to sprout, you know. <laughs> so, but somehow I managed to drag myself, or maybe, I think my mother may have gone to the school and protested, yeah. but, but I got out of 10E. But it, it was quite interesting. In my high school, it was 10-3. <laughs> it was the dumb room. That's, that's the one I was in. Um, <laughs> 
Did you have an urge, as they say in small town Canada sometimes, uh, certainly in Newfoundland or uh, Maritimes, Quebec, something, to get out of the small town? I want to get out. I want to go. I want to see the rest of the place or be somewhere else. Of course. Yeah. You know, I, <clears throat> I, the I, bus I, to Regina or Saskatoon. Yeah, or, or, or even a serious BC, yeah. you know, uh, um, to just to get away. And, and it was not even that it was a particularly horrible place. I mean, it was just the place where you had, uh, where you had maybe had too much history and, and you want to and get... too much a, geography. Yeah, and, and you also wanted to kind of reinvent yourself, yeah. right? Like, I mean, yeah. if you're in a small town, you may always remember, you know, remain little guy that everybody remembers and you did this and whatever. But if you get away from that, then you can start maybe defining yourself in a different way. What do you think the, uh, the good burgers of, of Esther Hazy think about Guy Van de Haag now? Is there a plaque anywhere or a... Well, okay, now this is, inter <laughs> this is interesting. Um, they have a rotating billboard outside the town. Uh, now, is that for the Ford dealership? It, or no, what? No, no, the, 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 it's advertising eminences from Astor Hazy. <laughs> but, but, but <clears throat> let me put it this way. You know, there, there are people like Dana Antall who played on the women, Canadian women's hockey team and things right. like that. And I, I guess I'm the sole solitary artistic type what, you know, yeah. however yeah. you want to call it. Yeah. No, so there is that. And <laughs> no, I'm they not, can get no, your whole name on the revolver. No, that's, that's the problem. That's why, why, why I have the name Guy, because my mother said, given the last name, he will never be able to fill out a form. <laughs> right? If it was Vladimir or something. Yeah, you know, and the other thing, too, is my, my father was a cowboy, and the, the, the man who has established the Calgary st uh, Stampede was Guy Weedix. Oh. So it was a nod to that. Was he too. a cowboy? My, my dad? Yeah. yeah he was Did a, he trail cattle? Did you ever trail cattle with him? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could he, but, throw, could he throw a hula hand hitch? And not, not so much. I mean, he had dislocated his shoulders oh, so many wow. times. that. But right. he, was, he, he had rodeoed. Uh, really? Yeah. Barrel racing or cutting or no? no. He he. Well, he was a pickup man, so he was kind yeah, of he yeah. was he was hired in that way. But wow. when he wasn't working that way, he rode saddle bronc. So he he was, didn't have the saddle bronc build. He was a big man. When I was a I little didn't know that. When he when I was a little kid, he looked at me and he said. The damn kid's legs are too long to ever be a saddle bronc rider. Is that right? <laughs> because most of them are very short. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. To get the grip. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to talk a bit about craft now. Do you write every day? Mostly every day. In I the mean, morning I, or when? Um, <clears throat> there was a time when I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning to do my writing and, you know, and get it done before noon. My habits have changed somewhat. So I, I get up later and write later. Um, when I first started writing, I mean, one of the, the hardest things for me to do was to discipline myself. Um, and over time, I learned how to do that. I mean, even when writing is hard or it's not going well, I know it's not going to go any better if I don't do it. Right, right. Um, so the divine afflatus doesn't descend, you know, inspiration comes in brief flashes. Do you try to avoid it at all? Uh, um, Morley Callahan couldn't start writing until the mailman came. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, I remember that one. Hugh, Hugh Garner had to sharpen pencils like mad. And Graham Greene had to stand out in the street and wait for a license That's plate. That's right, yeah. Um, I lost my superstition about writing when I lost my mechanical pencil. Right. I now, do people know yeah. what a mechanical pencil? I mean, the it's, script old pencil with the, yeah. yes. And I had found this mechanical pencil that I wrote my first book with, and then it fell out of my pocket, and a bus drove over it, and it was smashed, and I thought, okay, it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> the mechanical pencil is gone. gone. That's yeah, it. Th that's it. No, there goes the career. Yeah, I, can't, I, can't, I, I can't do this. I'm, Have I'm you graduated not. to the computer? Yes. Yeah. Do you write 
uh, on a yellow legal pad and then go to the computer, no. or you write on the computer? I, I wrote everything actually on yellow paper with yeah. the mechanical pencil, and then I decided if I'm going to get a computer, there's no point unless I learn to work on the keyboard. Right. So that was difficult for me. Can at you the touch beginning. Time? Yeah. 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 Uh, not correctly, but. <laughs> That's but a actually, drawback, isn't it? Well, but I, actually, I am fairly quick. Right. Maybe too quick because my doctor in the house told me I've got carpal tunnel syndrome in both wrists and I have oh. to have them operated on. Do you, how much time do you spend rewriting or revising or editing? I, you know, if I say that to my students, I have to do it myself. And I, I rewrite a lot. And when I get up in the morning, I always rewrite what I had written the day before you do. as a start. In some ways, I think it gets the motor running. You know, like even, you're not starting with something, you're not starting inventing at that point. You're, you're fixing, you're revising, you're doing something over. And if you're lucky when you're doing that, then, then you, you, you build up a certain pace, and then maybe you can move on to something that's new. But even despite that, I, I can't imagine that anything I've, I've written has, hasn't been rewritten many, many, many times. Have you ever been blocked? Yeah. yeah. What but, do you do in that situation? Well, I mean, <laughs> Blocking kind of comes more from, I think, personal circumstances, or when I have been blocked, than, than the writing itself, you know? Do you put the manuscript away in a drawer and wait it out? Or I, like baseball players in a slump, they don't get their hair cut. They yeah. change, <laughs> change their underwear. Yeah. Um, I'm not... I'm not sure how to answer that. I mean, I think probably the longest period that I've ever gone without writing, doing no writing whatsoever, is maybe nine months, something like That's that. That's a long time. It's yeah. a gestational time, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose, yeah. yeah. And when, it's interesting that you go from short story to novel to uh, back to short story, so is there, what prompts you to do one over the other? Is it? I think in this case, you know, when I return to the to the, to the short story. I mean, I've always loved short stories, mm -hmm. and my first book was a collection of short stories. It and was I, Man Descending. Yeah. yeah, and I remember after that was was published, it was often said to me, or reviewers would say, when I started writing novels, well, he's certainly a better short story writer than he is a novelist. I began thinking that probably not many people ever knew that I wrote short stories. You know, I, I, I think that if I was being thought of as anything, I was being thought of as a historical novelist. But I love the form. Um, I think that it does things that novels don't do, and those were some of the things that I wanted to try and do again. When you finish a work, whether it's a short story or a novel, is there a hiatus period, or do you jump right in and start writing again? I try to jump right back in and start writing again, but when a book comes out, I've never been able to write any place except at home. Right. I haven't been able to write in hotel rooms. I haven't been able to go to on writing retreats to write. Or libraries. Or, or, or libraries or anything like that. So... If I'm traveling, or if I'm doing a kind of book tour, or anything like that, I can't write. I, I, I don't even attempt to write. Uh, I try and get something started before I have to do that, if I'm lucky in terms of timing, um, so that I have something to return to. Do you have a desk that faces a wall? A wall. <laughs> or a beautiful prairie? No, a wall, a wall, a Really? Wall. Yeah. You don't want to look at the... No, it's, um, my my office. There was there was someone who was making a documentary on. I think the working title was something like 
messy, creative people. Ah. And, and another filmmaker who had seen my office because I was working on a screenplay with him suggested me as a topic. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't let him in the door, but it's, I, I'm surrounded by, by chaos, but I still know where everything is. And if things get tidied up, then I have no idea where anything is. Well, you certainly have tidied them up in, in Daily Lemon. It's a delight. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank Guy Vanderhaeg. Now, we have some microphones set up for some questions, uh, comments, reactions, anything at all. And, uh, and Guy will do his best to answer anything you ask. I got to ask you just before we get someone to the microphone. You taught for a number of years. You taught creative writing. And had you not taught, could you have lived on your royalties? No, no, no. I, no. Is that still the case in this country? That for the vast majority of writers, that's absolutely yeah. true. Um, I, I think that you. Ninety-five percent of writers have to have something sure. to rely on. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, you say you rewrite. So does a page become half a page, or does a page become a page and a half? It can, it can be both. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's a question of, um, I, I, I don't know who it was who, who once said, which I, I don't believe is absolutely true, is go through your work and cut out all the good bits, right? Because you can find, you can fall in love with a sentence that doesn't serve the whole. On the other hand, you will sometimes say to yourself, this needs more. So for me, rewriting is both. It's both cutting and it's, it's both expanding. And do you ever have two, on the go, two stories on the go at a time? No. I, I, I don't have that kind of, you know, I'm not a good multitasker, so I can't, <laughs> I can't go back and forth you know, between, between several stories. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd be interested to know, in your early years, 10 to 20 years old, did you have uh, one or two favorite authors? And if we fast forward to the last few years, uh, do you have favorite authors, or do you stress your reading of fiction versus nonfiction? OK, that's an interesting question, because like, one of the things was, is when I was very young, and right, like right through my teens, I read everything without very much distinction, without very much separation. So when I was in high school, I remember I was reading James Bond novels, but I stumbled on John Updike's Rabbit Run in the local drugstore, and on the cover it said it was a novel about a basketball player, and I bought it, right? <laughs> and so that was an eye-opener for me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I, 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 I was kind of a, a print addict, so I read everything. And the question about, like, who's your favorite writer? If you ask me that question on Tuesday, it might be answered def differently than if you asked me on Wednesday. There are writers that I return to again and again for different reasons. So... I reread constantly the 19th century Russian novelists. Uh, and then there, are, then there are writers who I, I read because they make me happy. You know, they, I, I, ju I just enjoy the, 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 the books. I, I wouldn't call them like pure entertainment, but like for instance, if I'm feeling a little moody, I'll, I'll I'll pick up an Evelyn Waugh novel uh, because, you know, he's, he's a great stylist and yeah. a sharp wit and all of those kinds of things. Um, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's a hard question to answer. But I gather you, I'm sensing from what you've said that you read a lot more fiction than nonfiction. Is that fair? I would say it's 60-40. I read... I read fiction, a, not... Yeah, yeah, about 60% fiction, about, about 40% nonfiction. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. This is a real thrill for me because I love your novels and Thank I'm you. just so excited tonight to hear about and this interview. 
Um, I'm really interested in the history part of your writing in, in terms of um, the Civil War. I kind of feel like there's maybe a story there and an interest. And I always think as a historian person or someone thinking about history that the Civil War is just, it's just so important even to Canadians. And, and I'm not sure, uh, especially being from the West, you're closer to the US in that mindset. Can you tell me if you've ever thought about maybe what a novel could like if you took off where Custis Straw, <laughs> his story maybe didn't get finished and um, it would just be a real treat if you did take that story somewhere. Uh, okay, now I have an assignment. My name is Sandra. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it now. Oh, thank you. No, I, I mean, I've kind of circled the, the Civil War because yeah, it is important in Canadian history. So, for instance, in A Good Man, yeah. um, one of the, the characters in that is, is actually working against unionist organizers who are coming up to, into Ontario to recruit people to, you know, to, to, to fight for the union. The, the, the histories of the two countries, Canada and the United States, it can't be separated. You know, we, we occupy a continent, we occupy a history. Um, whether I would feel confident to, to, to write uh, a novel about the Civil War, which I think would probably have to inhabit an American perspective, unless I sent a kid, and there were, a, a, a lot of Canadians yeah. who actually fought in the Civil War. <clears throat> I could perhaps imagine a Canadian um, uh, fighting, fighting in the Union Army. I mean, there was a Canadian who won a Congressional Medal of Honor uh, uh, fighting for the North. Can I have a follow-up question? Sure. I, Go ahead. That was a fair answer, by the way. <laughs> Don't commit. Um, I'm thinking about uh, redemption and uh, yeah. how important that is in your stories and godfulness and godlessness and that floating back and forth between that story and religion and all that mix up. Um, how important is redemption in terms of the the humans and the stories, um, and how did that work that way, that its way into your characters, quite a bit. I, I, wow! I, yeah, a, I said, no. okay. <laughs> um, I, I think. I mean, my, my my my. It's it's kind of hard to to speak about this without sounding, perhaps too moralizing. But I think that self-reflection is part of redemption. That you cannot redeem yourself unless you actually look at yourself with as clear an eye as you possibly can. In my character's best moments, I think that they do that. And in their worst moments, they shut their eyes to self-reflection. And, and self-reflection is redemption. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I had a question about the actual craft of writing. So in your novels, um, you have many characters coming together from different angles, and they have ongoing stories that they bring to the novel when they come together. I'm just wondering, do you make like a schematic map when you're starting a novel? Like, I'm, I'm just, uh, for example, The Last Crossing, and there's all sorts of things going on in there. And I'm just wondering, is there some sort of grand plan that you make as a writer before you sit down? Or do you actually carry all these stories with you as you go through the novel? Index cards, <laughs> post-it notes, something. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing? No. I have a general idea where a novel's going to go. And then I try to get the voice of the principal character. I operate on you know, what I said earlier about what Creighton said, character and circumstance. Once I've got the voice of a character, 
and once I know something about what motivates them, what drives them, what they want, I put them in situations, and I hope a story develops out of that. Um, now, every writer works diff differently, but if I were to do anything very schematic, I would actually feel like I was doing paint by numbers. <laughs> no, I, I, would, I would lose the adventure <coughs> of the story for myself. If I knew in any great detail what was going to happen before I arrived at that moment, the, the, the writing of a novel for me would be more like doing a report. Okay, and I, you know, <clears throat> I used to write reports for a consulting company, and I kind of feel like I was doing that again. For other writers, that works perfectly, but it doesn't for me. So just to follow up, then when you bring a new character into one of your novels, and you've already got your main character established and the, and the storyline is following through, you haven't done sort of background thinking or sketching in your own brain what that new character is going to bring in. You're just able to bring that person in and have her or him integrate into the storyline. Well, I mean, sometimes I'll start with a, like triplets, like I did in The Last Crossing, the, th the three English brothers, mm -hmm. right? So I started with, with these triplets, and I had a vague idea about basically what their characters needed to be to drive the, the narrative forward. Once I got the narrative going, then I would think about, okay, they go to North America, who might they meet? Okay, and, and, and what kind of character do they need to meet to serve the novel's narrative? Hmm. You know, that it's, <clears throat> I don't think it's much different than what you're talking about. I'm just not doing a diagram. You know, I'm, 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 I'm moving through, I'm moving through the novel more with my characters rather than deciding where they're going to go and then taking them there. It doesn't mean that I don't have a plan. I mean, I have a very vague plan. John Irving says he knows the last sentence of the novel. Before he's a lucky he's, man. <laughs> before, he, before he starts it. Yeah. No, <laughs> he's, he's... Last, yes, I think one more question. Hi, good uh, evening. Um, you said earlier when you were studying history back at university, you have a master's in history, and that you went to, to check out the English literature reading list and read it, and you had said that uh, you, you joked that you have um, unsupervised opinions about literature. I'm wondering if that, I would assume, that would have influenced the type of writing that you do. Are there any specific influences because you didn't have um, the opinions of perhaps professors that might be kind of swaying you to think a certain way? Well, I mean, I, I, stumbled, I stumbled across writers that, that were not being taught. Um, English writers like Anthony Powell, who wrote Dance to the Music of Time, which is kind of like a vast canvas of British society at a particular moment in time. Um, or, and in fact, I just kind of wrote a little something for the, for the Globe, a, a very a forgotten writer by the name of James Gould Cousins, whose reputation was savaged by Dwight MacDonald in the commenta in co in commentary, and I don't think he ever recovered from it, but I think he wrote one of the really, really fine novels about the Second World War. None of, n neither of those writers would be taught in an English class, I don't think, unless it was a very specific seminar. Um, I think that they're well, particularly Powell, perhaps less so Cousins because his work admittedly is pretty uneven, but I don't think he's, he's a writer that would appear on a curriculum. I read the curriculum, but I also stumbled on, 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 on other writers and other books that became important to me. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Thank you.